I love, I love the transcription of, of what I say. So, so all that view survived. What city fell and it looked like the whole war was over? New York. Yeah, New York, the battle of Long, Long Island. Washington's going to lose virtually every war, every battle he's going to fight. It. And yet win the war. Lord Dunmore, what move would he make in Virginia that would push many people to want for independence? Certain type of people. Yeah. Well, he, he might do that down the road, but he did something even bigger than that. Yeah. Free, free who? Free yeah. Free Freed enslaved people if they fought for the British, and thousands would. If they fought for the British, they would be free. And you see the British split. Oh, where did they get cannon from? Ticonderoga. Who was the hero of Ticonderoga that ordered the cannon there? Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold. Speaking of that, let's get to Arnold. Do I talk about Christmas? Do I talk about the Hessians? Yes, they're German. They're German. They're German. Yes. Beware the Germans. Let's get this right now. It's over. Everybody thought it was over. How just hung out there. I am going to take you to New Jersey. Who's been to New Jersey? Now it's going to be all of us. Are you bragging about it? Grab New Jersey. Everywhere? And as a punishment, they made you go to Jersey? <laughs> I'm going to draw you basically New York to Philadelphia, across northern New Jersey. So, are you ready? Here is New York City. Got it? Good? Everyone see that? New York City? Here's Philadelphia. This is River, the Delaware River. I know, and it's the last one I have left. Wow, Delaware is straight. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shockingly straight. Right? Yeah, you should go there. Well, you've been there. Yeah, it's really I mean, it's like an arrow. So, there's nothing more than a wagon ruts. And there's no bridges anywhere in the columns over anything besides a ditch. And so anything that anything that's more than a few feet wide, they would have to have a ford. So basically two wagon runs that went north here. There was a ford here at Trenton. There's also a little town here called Princeton. Here's Philadelphia. Ford down here. How did you stay in New York? Wait until spring, the war is over, he got complacent, and so just garrisoned a few of the little towns here. And since this is the wild wilderness, that's where the Hessians were. Washington is across the Delaware and his army is literally bleeding away. Every night men are deserting. There's no food, terrible shelter. It's an absolute disaster for Washington. He is barely holding them together and probably less than a thousand men. There's over a thousand um, Hessians here and 30,000 British in New York just waiting to come down the road. And so just, it's over. And back in Philadelphia, they're freaking. The few patriots, few members of the Continental Congress that are there are literally ready to run. Adams is saying, Washington has got to be fired and replaced by a general by the name of Charles Lee, who would have been a disaster. So Washington's here. And that's what he hears about. He did not tell you about the Christmas celebration, right? He hears about it because there's patriot spies everywhere. Think about it. How would the Germans ever know that Germans? How would the Germans ever know that some of the loyalists are patriots? It's hard enough for the British to know. And so they told Washington there's going to be a big, drunken, kind of like just a vegetable blow off steam on Christmas Day. Washington rolled the dog. And this is an all or nothing. Remember, he has to survive. If he crosses the river and attacks and loses his army, the Revolutionary War is over. What day does he attack? Mm -hmm. 
happened this January 20th. The day after, before sunup, while they're sleeping it off. And so they crossed the Delaware, north of town, and it's, think about, or no, even before they crossed, think about you know, 30 to 35 degrees, so just above freezing, just below you, depending on the night, sleety, some areas have snow, it's really humid there, terrible gear, so they're just miserable. Washington called the few men there in formation, and they're shivering, you'll have to even have shoes. And when he got there, he read, remember Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense. Thomas Paine, that fall, wrote another one called The American Crisis, another pamphlet. And this might be his best, because that fall, it looked like it was over. And all these people were, were, who were all for the revolution in fall, or in summer, are ready to leave. And Washington read this pamphlet to his shivering men. I doubt they heard much more than the first few lines, but the first few lines are great. So I'm going to read you just a little bit of American Crisis. So it's, it's only about half of this book. So get comfortable, everybody. It's going to take a while. Just going to read a few lines. This is a bunch of American documents. Oh, it has a great beginning. I mean, what a way with words Thomas Paine had. These are the times that try men's souls. That's a good beginning. The times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love of the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What's a summer soldier and a sunshine patriot? We know? Say it again. Yeah, when times are good in the summer, they're all for the revolution. And then when times got bad, they ran away. So he's saying, those ones who fled, those are deserting, they were never with us. They're never ones we could count on. But what is he telling? He's pain is saying, now Washington is telling those shivering men in front of him, what are they? The true patriots. They're the true patriots. And so the crisis, he warned, hey, there's always going to be people. When times are good, you're always going to have lots of friends. When times are bad, that's when the real patriots, you're the best. And he finishes with, it's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice you are all making. Now, that might get him on the boat to cross the very cold river. We'll see what else they have afterwards. Maybe the promise of food and warmth and shoes. And so they cross. They cross a little bit north, turn south towards Trent. Loyalists who heard him cross ran into Trent to try to wake up the Germans, wake up the Hessians. And what was the problem? Yeah, they couldn't wake anybody up. They got a few men up, and the continental forces, half of them, their powder got wet in the crossing, so their muskets were worthless. And you could follow their march for their bloody footprints. They have shoes. But they attack in this total surprise. Hessians are kind of pouring out of barns wherever they're trying to sleep to get a little bit of warmth, trying to put their uniforms on, and the Continental smashed in. And after a sharp fight, it was over. The Hessians were defeated, taken prisoner, and many of them lost their boots. That was the first thing, we're taking those and your coats. And they would pardon them and let them walk back. They took their weapons and they let them walk back to New York. That those are the conditions of the surrender. Washington won, he couldn't take prisoners. Great victory. Not enough to turn any tide of the war. It was a small force, but remember, Washington had to stay in the fight. By winning this victory, he shows he's in the fight. Then Washington would cross back, then cross back again, and camp south of town. How took a few days, heard about it, infuriated, angry at those uh, lazy Germans, as he said, and marched now over 10,000 men under one of his best commanders, Lord Cornwallis, as fast as they could down to take on Washington and destroy him once and for all. 
when they got close to Trenton, Washington, who fled a little bit south, knew he couldn't fight. No way. First of January, Cornwallis got the Trenton. Second of January, Cornwallis decided to attack. Washington that night knew Cornwallis would attack. Anybody know what he did? He did it at Long Island, too. Before he retreated, though, he did something to make the British think he was still. They lit campfires like it was a normal night and then retreated. Cornwallis attacked an empty, empty camp, but Washington was not done. So he retreated, attacked the British rear guard at Princeton, surprised them there. Took a lot of guts to do this. January 3rd, 1777. Now, Princeton, he just thought didn't work. His lines got disorganized. They didn't attack the way he wanted to. Men got lost. A lot of them stopped and started eating the British food. You know, just all things fell apart. The British counterattacked and nearly drove the Continentals off. And this could have been a horrible defeat. But Washington rode to the front horseback. Now think about it. A guy on horseback, everyone's going to be shooting at him. He started waving his hat, screaming at him, rallying them, kind of hitting people with his hat, trying to turn them to fight again. He rallied the American forces, and the British, exhausted, retreated. Another victory. Washington chased after him, screaming, it's a fox hunt, boys, follow me. And they fought, chased him out of Princeton. He had a musket hole here and through his hat. You can imagine he thought he was a pretty charmed life. Washington, they make mistakes in the battle. He lost more battles than he won, but he showed his leadership. And then, before Cornwallis could turn, they fled north up to a place called Morristown, spent a miserable winter, but he kept the army intact. This is what we got to get about Trenton, Trenton and Princeton. This is what we got to get. It showed the colonists, the Continentals, they could win. Everyone got that? It showed they could win. And that is the key part. It showed they can win. So we got the American crisis. These two battles are huge. They were not big enough victories to turn the tide of the war, per se. But after defeat, after defeat, and when everyone thought it was over, they could win a battle. Trenton and Princeton are huge. We can win. We're in the fight. And also, it's... Um, the Congo Congress didn't replace them, by the way. That would have been a terrible disaster. So, let's get back to this. Then. As you see, there's the Hessians. I'm going to quick scroll through this. So, has anyone seen this painting? It's one of the most famous paintings ever made. It's Washington crossing the Delaware. Now, it's inaccurate in a lot of ways. You know, this is supposed to be very nationalistic. Nationalistic as is your intense love for your country. We'll get to nationalism. We're not... Nationalism really isn't around quite yet in 1776. And this was painted in the 1840s. And though it's crossing the Delaware, no, it was not choked with ice. The boats were bigger. He wasn't a lunatic. He was not standing on the bow of the ship. But it's still a pretty dramatic shot. It's very nationalistic. Pro. Actually, it's not the United States. It was drawn by a German. And it was for German nationalism. And it was drawn to try to show if, the, if this new country called the United States could do it, so could all these little kingdoms and principalities. They could do it and create what's a country called Germany. So this shows the impact of the American Revolution. This impacted German nationalism too. By the way, I took this picture. I know I've, I've better picture, but I thought this one just because I kind of like the people standing there looking at it. But this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. But it was painted by a German, or German nationalist. And everyone thinks that's an American painting? And of course, why not? And it's shown in the Metropolitan Museum of Art because it was bought by an American. She's really into it. So that shows the impact of the American Revolution. It's a cool thing. Totally inaccurate. I don't I think the frame is just gold gilded, but I bet it's it's huge. I mean, 
If, is anyone, if you ever get a chance to go to New York City, yeah, go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's really cool. Uh, last time I was there, I got lost, but you know, stuff happened. It's huge. Every room starts looking the same. But this was done. Here's an American one from the 1850s. And I love the creepy George Washington face. That's not the way it looked. That's from a painting from 20 years later, but they show this old man. It's weird, or maybe old woman. I'm not sure what they're trying to do because that's the way they drew paintings, but that's the painting. And so you have all these pictures of George Washington copying that. And that is why I put it up there when you walked in. Have you heard the story about George Washington who cut down the cherry tree and he told it because he could never tell a lie? Who believes that's true? Of course it is because he would never tell a lie. Even though it's made up 40 or 30 years after he died, but by I mean Parson Weems. So remember this picture right here? There's this book called about Parson Weems' story where he made up all these fake stories about George Washington. And here's Parson Weems showing off the picture. And now they have George Washington as a little boy. And look at the face. Ah! That's an homunculus. In medieval art, they would take babies and they would draw them as adults. So all these medieval paintings of the Madonna and child of Christianity they would show uh, Jesus as a full-grown adult, and they're that creepy. So, yeah, the truth, it's, the whole thing is weird. I like the finger. All right. So let's get to 1777, the British strategy. The British strategy. 1777. Okay, Trent and Princeton were a big deal, but they're not going to quit. And so the British strategy is this. If we're in New York, we also, that's Canada, Canada. This was the avenue of invasion. So they said in 1777 they would invade. They actually tried to invade earlier in 1776. They wanted to take all of Lake Champlain and get back Ticonderoga. But the British made a scratch fleet, basically just quick made ships on, on Lake Champlain. And so did, so did the colonial militia, New York militia. And the New York militia defeated them in a battle. This, um, they found one of the ships fully intact like 40 years ago. But 1776, so the British had to start here. Well, the only reason I mentioned in this because this would become crucial. The militia commander was a guy named Benedict Arnold. So once again, Arnold's a hero. Arnold's an interesting guy. So 1777, New York, if they take along the Hudson, If they take New York along the Hudson, that would cut off New England. And so, General Howe, General Howe will move up the Hudson from New York. There is a, a pretty powerful port here called West Point that blocks the, blocks the Hudson, but the Howe would just overwhelm it. And then General Jonathan Burgoyne, another a very competent British general, he would advance south from Lake Champlain, and they would meet here, cutting off New England. New England could be defeated in kind. The rest of the colonies will be isolated. Patriotic fever, they'll show that patriotic fever will go away, and they'll win. That's the plan. It's not a terrible plan. General Howe receives it that spring. The plan is to march together both when it warms up till June, July. So got about three months time to campaign. How gets it? And I was like, that's an interesting plan from London. Thank you for that plan. Oh, split up the How's that? Like, hmm, I like that idea. I'm gonna attack Philadelphia instead. So Howe ignored it. And his brother's the commander of the Royal Navy. So this way it looks at it. We have the Navy. Why would we get rid of our advantage of the Navy when we attack anywhere on the coast? Post. And the Continental Congress is in Philadelphia. To his point of view, that's the capital. We take the capital, they quit. He's thinking like it's a European war. They take the capital, they sign a peace agreement, it's over. Not understanding that who cares if Philadelphia falls? The Continental Congress just leaves as long as Washington's army's in the fight. 
And so they use the Royal Navy and attack this one. Washington comes down and meets them. Nobody tells Burgoyne. He's marching now past Lake Champlain with no idea he's alone in what was really a howling wilderness. So Philadelphia is going to fall. Washington tries to stop at a place like Brandy, at a place called Brandywine that September. Same thing as Long Island. They fought fairly well in the beginning, but the British surrounded their flanks. This is a painting of the British soldiers after the battle. Uh, I just like the way that drummer boy is sitting. Stretching. And he left his flanks in air. Washington's army collapsed. Philadelphia falls. But another battle out after Philadelphia falls a month later, so in October, called Germantown, once again, the Continental troops fought back. Does that make sense? One more time. So it's like, they're not winning, but Washington's army survived, and they're in the fight. And the Continental Congress, they just fled to York, Pennsylvania, and kept meeting. It didn't do what Howe wanted. Howe could take Philadelphia and New York. The fight still goes on. And Burgoyne is marching into the wilderness, totally isolated. He's got a little bit over 10,000 troops. He's marching this way. Another British force marched this way. And uh, we're ambushed at a place called Orris County, but we hear about this. Burgoyne realizes it by September. And now he's stuck. If he retreats, he loses everything he got. But he was out there in the middle of the wilderness in winter beds. He's done. He's got to get to Albany, which is right here. Between him and Albany is a continental force of militia, a few trained forces. Oops. At a, a place called Bennis Heights, where three battles will be fought that we lump together as Saratoga. And Saratoga, yeah, Trenton and Prince of being so important, but Saratoga is this turning point battle. It changes everything. Oh, there's gonna be, we missed something here, let me go back, yeah. October 1777, three battles. The Continental Army is led by a former British officer by the name of Horatio Gates. And Gates was basically given command, because you're in the British Army, you're an officer, good enough. And so here's Albany, the British are advancing this way. Here's the heights. They can dig in so the militia won't run away. Two different times, Burgoyne, Burgoyne's forces fail. The third time at Saratoga, at this battle, the third time, so we got Horatio Gates, the third time the British almost break through. Here's a picture of the rallying of the forces. The British forces break through. Continental militia begins to run, and it looks like it's over. Gates, second in command is that commander of New York militia, Benedict Arnold. Arnold was very vocal in the first two battles, claiming that Gates was incompetent. <laughs> Gates had him arrested. So Arnold is literally under house, under tent arrest. He's literally in a tent under armed guard. Gates had Arnold arrested. Arnold is sitting in the tent, and you can see men fleeing outside the flat, and his guard took off. Arnold ran out and realized it, tried to rally men. And he's yelling at him in the process. He grabbed a musket and he somehow got a hands of a sword trying to stop these men from fleeing. And then a riderless horse came by. And just like in a movie, he grabbed the reins and mounted the horse as it was coming by at full gallop, reared the horse back, screaming and waving the, the butt of the musket at men, hitting them and whacking them rally, stop, and yelling every obscenity in the great book of obscenities of 1777. There was a book, it was really well read. Just screaming everything they can. Men start to rally. They turn and fought little pockets with Arnold. The exhausted British soldiers, when they got to these few men that were rallying, they just couldn't do it anymore. And the British attack broke. Benedict Arnold saved Saratoga. We're going basically knew he was out of supplies and stuck, and Saratoga would be a huge, decisive, and world-turning victory. One of the most important battles in American history. Everyone got that? And once again, Arnold's the hero. And this showed that the United States 
They can't just win a battle. They can win the war. And who did they show? What country? France. It showed France that was looking for any way to get back at the British. We're going with surrender, and that would trigger the Franco-American alliance. And also, Spain jumped into the war. They're still mad at the British. And the Netherlands declared war on the British, too. Now, let's be clear about it. Those three countries didn't care a lick about the colonists. They just wanted to get the British. This painting's at the rotunda of the United States Capitol. If you go there, it's that painting. It's right there, and it's Gates accepting the surrender of Oregon. And a lot of people think it's Washington. No, it's, it's Gates. Huge painting of the rotunda. Gates nearly got command of the whole Continental Army. Thankfully, he didn't. But this will turn it into a worldwide war. Now British colonies everywhere from India to the Mediterranean to the Caribbean, and remember, the French kept three islands in the Caribbean, are now threatened. Overnight, everything changes. And the French, it'll take a while but they send all the things, they have to get through the British blockade, but all the things Continental thrown out. Money, weapons, training, and troops. By 1781, over half of Washington's army will be French. The United States could not have won the war. They could not have survived without French aid. With the French aid, the British are going to be stretched thin, and that will allow for the political victory. That is how wars are won. That's how wars are won. And so the U.S. owes everything to France. And so from now on, the United, from this moment on, the United States must do whatever France wants because they helped us win this war. Sound fair? Now, I would argue that perhaps World War I and World War II, we'd even, if we're even. We're cool. So that's how we won. French aid. Now, there's going to be other fights, other things that are going to happen, but Saratoga is the biggie. And that's the memorial. It's Saratoga. This was built after Bunker Hill. You know, got to make an obelisk. We got to have an obelisk. And on the side of this, they have the various heroes of the war. So that's like Gates. That's the old wagoneer, Daniel Morgan. They have nothing for directly for Arnold. All they have for Arnold is a boot. <laughs> Arnold was horribly wounded, shot in the gut. Took a musket ball right here, and somehow survived. Because in 1777, what could you do? What could you do for somebody shot in the gut? The best case scenario would probably be just good luck. Because when they try to poke and prod to get the bullet out, they probably cause even more emotion. Or they had a chance if they cut the, if, you know, they got chances other places to cut. But Benedict Arnold was furious. He got none of the credit. Gates took it all and never acknowledged Arnold's, Arnold's rallying the troops. Remember we have talked about Washington getting slighted? No, or nothing is more corrosive than when somebody feels slighted. They feel as though they're not being respected. And that's what happened to Arnold. So Arnold actually, so the British evacuated Philadelphia after the French entered because they realized why hold Philadelphia. And he moved to Philadelphia, and as he took him over a year to convalesce, where he could finally fight again, it's never quite the same. But he started befriending, or another way to look at it is loyalists in Philadelphia started befriending him. And basically saying, yeah, you know, we, we don't agree with your cause, but boy, they don't treat their heroes well, do they? And they just, they didn't even acknowledge you. He married the, the daughter of a prominent loyalist family and became connected with them. And Gates and other people didn't like Arnold because he, he was kind of bombastic. And so with that, eventually, in 1780, Washington would give him command of that really important fort on the Hudson called West Point. West Point, New York City's right here. There's this high cliffs where the river makes this pretty sharp turn. 
and to that fort. As long as the Old West want, the British can't go up the Hudson River. And across the river, they have these huge chains. If you go to West Point today, they have the chains that the boots on this day. So no boats can go up the Hudson. And this is a picture of looking back at the cliffs. And Washington gave Benedict Arnold command of West Point because he thought, OK, Arnold, because of his wound, can't really fight on the battlefield as much as he used to be able to. But we need a good leader in command. Little did Washington know that by then, Arnold had already decided that I'm never going to get the credit I use. I'm going to help these loyalists. And he agreed to give up West Point. Arnold agreed to give West Point to the British. Basically have the American guards there open the gates. Uh, give up or uh, evacuate the gates, allow the British to come in and give it up. Now, fortunately, the British didn't have a full offensive. It was just going to be they're going to take over the fort and, and, and then Arnold would surrender. But he was communicating with a British officer. That officer was captured. Here's a little plaque near West Point that has the side of the treason. He was married, talking to a, a, a Major Andre. And Andre, who put on a shawl over his British uniform, was captured with a note from Benedict Arnold. And the plot was spoiled literally the evening before it was going to happen. I should add, why did Andre have a cloak over his British uniform? Good guess, though. He did, he, so he didn't want to respond as pretty, but why, should, why was he wearing his British uniform stuff? Good guess, but no. Huh? Talking to the others. Close. What happens to spies? The spy is off. Spies are killed. They kill spies immediately. Be treated as a soldier. That's why. He had a uniform on. He be treated as a soldier. So that's why he wore that on So he can take it off. No, I'm just a soldier. I'm not a spy. His spies are killed. Death penalty. So. Just in the nick of time, Arnold literally jumped out the window of his headquarters, mounted a horse, and escaped just before arrest. And so Arnold would eventually he would go to West Virginia or in <laughs> Virginia and lead Loyalist cavalry for two years, and then would finish his life in London. And that would make him the most up until the Civil War the most famous traitor in American history. And the name Benedict Arnold is going to be synonymous with treason. And this is going to be a picture after the Civil War, or after the Revolutionary War. And basically, it's attacking, this is attacking uh, the new Republican Party, which is going to become the Democratic Party. Also confusing. But traitor General Arnold, and they show him the two phase, and who's that? Yeah, it was above. Yes, it's safe. So, the most famous traitor. And I remember being told by a teacher, I can't remember the teacher, but it was in elementary school, that Arnold would forever regret betraying his country and to spend the rest of his life in misery in London with worried about the country he betrayed. No, actually, he was perfectly fine. So, Very quickly, what's happening in the West? Uh, what's the bell ring this period? So let's get to some really quick. In the West. Now we're going to skip ahead. There was some really bloody fighting along the West. And, you know, I, I'm not going to make you know Joseph Branson. But the Iroquois joined the British. The Iroquois Confederation. Why? Because the British might protect their land. And in 1777, they attacked colonial settlements all along the frontier. Joseph Brown was one of the leaders. I just like that picture. But the point is, the Iroquois joined. So this had the feeling like they were with the Allied with the French. So the Iroquois joined. And this is going to stimulate the Continental Congress to organize militia along the frontier to fight back against these allies of the British. And this is the name we have to get. Uh, the Iroquois would lose. We're going to jump right to here. 
George Rogers Clark would attack these tribes and also move west along the Ohio River. Here is him taking the British surrender at a British fort called Vincennes, which used to be a French fort. Here are his rangers, they were called, as they advanced westward. But they went all the way to Ohio and attacked what is now East St. Louis to give the United States a claim to this land after the Revolutionary War. So George Rogers Clark and also attack American Indians who were trying to defend their land. He'd become one of the big heroes of the war. His brother would also join the army after, but he was too young, way too young. Some of you might have heard of this book. Who? Mary Lewis and William Clark. I bet no one said Lewis Clark. It was old Lewis Clark. Yeah, his brother would be. All right. So, everybody write down Southern Strategy, 1779 to 1781, and then stop right there. So, when we do a test in this class, I gave the review list before, and you notice there are asterisks. Don't worry about this. I, we're, we'll, we'll stick this up tomorrow, okay? Sound good? I put down asterisks. Asterisks are what you need for your short essays. And your short essays are something we do in class. I'm big into short essays. And I like short essays, basically the middle or the, the meat of a paragraph or an essay too. And it's a great way to ask you lots of questions, make you write, you can write what you know. It gives you more opportunity to get better grades. You should want to write. Multiple choice, and there's going to be 26, I believe, multiple choice on your test. They're hard. And multiple choice, if you get it wrong, you get no credit at all. Writing, you get some credit. If you write, you get some part of it right. Even if you don't have everything, you get some credit. You want to write. That allows you to write what you know. You get some credit. You show off what you know. Writing so much better. I know it's more work. So much better. But there's certain ways I do it. They're called short ID. And so this is what we have to get. So if you took your notes away, you better make sure you write this down. You need this. You need this. I say you have to write any more for your notes. But you still have to get, make sure you get this down. A short ID is a short essay with no topic sentence. No topic sentence. So you just start writing. But you got to have it. I just give you a term. So it's relatively open ended. And it's basically this one to two sentences. Now I'm going to say one to two. What is how many sentences does that really mean? Two. Yes. I mean, you might be able to get away with one, but let's be clear about it. And, what I, and don't count the sentences. Don't write down. The Battle of Trenton was a battle. It was fought in a battle. It was fought with men. Period. No, those aren't sentences. Good, complex sentences. And that's a brief summary. What, where, when. Don't make up a date. Don't put down the Battle of Trenton was June 14, 1952, because you forgot. Put down the year. Put down, even if you put down the decade, put down after it happened, something. Try to get the basic essence of what happened. Then, an example of it. Example of what happened in the battle, or if it's a, or if it's a specific, or it's like a, a specific, I can't talk about specific idea like mercantilism. Then put down you an example of, of like a British law, and then why it's important. What did it lead to? And that is the most important thing. And it can't be. And it led to peace and happiness, where everybody was now buddies. No, something specific. The Battle of Trenton and Princeton led to the Americans feeling that they're in the fight, that they could win the war. Now, wait a second, wait a second. I know the bell rings. I didn't time this very well. I blame society. I put, I'll put this up, and I'll remind you again tomorrow, but I give you a, an example of it. I gave you an example, and I also put it on TV. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. See you tomorrow, everybody. Did everyone like the creepy picture of George Fox?
That means it's going to be it's going to be hot at about two o'clock. That's when it's going to start. <laughs> What are we thing back in the 80s? Hey, how we doing? Who, pray tell, wants me to do this? Did you see that? Didn't even bounce. Yeah. That's when you drop the mic. The flamingo is not on, I don't think. It was on. Look at the batteries, Dad. Everyone say goodbye. I'm stopping recording.